Yeah. Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee in 2024. Before we begin, could I remind anyone using electronic devices to switch them to silent, please? I have apologies from Finlay Carson, which is why I'm convening this morning, and why Jamie Halker Johnson has joined us as his committee substitute. Our first item of business this morning is consideration of an affirmative SSI, the Scottish Food Commission Appointment Regulations 2024. I welcome to the meeting Marie Goujon, Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands, and her officials, Lisa Novak, Policy Officer, Good Food Nation Team, and James Hamilton, Legal Directorate. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to the committee to speak to these regulations. Now, the Good Food Nation Scotland Act 2022 establishes that a Scottish Food Commission is to be set up, and as we're working towards this goal, one of the first tasks will be to appoint members to the Scottish Food Commission. The schedule of the Act stipulates that the appointments of members of the Scottish Food Commission are to be made in accordance with regulations made by Scottish ministers, and this instrument, therefore, provides the necessary framework for the appointment of those members. The the purpose of the instrument is twofold and relates directly to the appointment process of members to provide that Scottish ministers must have regard to the desirability of members who are representative of interests of the food business sector and food related third sector bodies and to provide that Scottish ministers must have regard to the desirability of members having experience or expertise of food related issues in relation to a range of relevant matters. These set of requirements provide an, an important context and refer back to the aims of the Good Food Nation Act. They will provide a meaningful and relevant framework for the Scottish ministers when making appointments. However, they do so without being overly restrictive or limiting in terms of the potential pool of candidates and to ensure that there is a degree of flexibility maintained within that. This also ensures that the regulations are also future-proof to any changing needs of the body throughout its existence due to their flexibility. And with that, I'm just happy to take questions uh, and hear any comments that committee members may have. Thank you. Thank you. Do any members have any questions? Emma Harper. Thank you. Thanks, um, convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in, in my work on health committee and in various cross-party groups that are health-related, I've been looking at high-fat sugar, salt, different types of um, issues around ultra-processed foods and following the work of Henry Dimbleby and Chris Van Tolliken. So I'm interested in the work around the Food Commission as far as will it contain, um, I suppose, a remit to look at food production as well as food security, because that's something that I think is part of how we look at the whole food supply, uh, the, the whole food system. Is that something that the Food Commission will, will have as a focus? Um, you're absolutely uh, right to, I think, highlight just the, uh, I think from what you've mentioned there, just the, the breadth of policy areas that, that food touches. Uh, that's why, I mean, I would point out at the moment that we have our Good Food Nation plan, which is out to consultation until the the 22nd of April and ultimately the Scottish Food Commission's role is really to, to monitor the effectiveness of that plan and of course we can ask the Commission to pick up specific pieces of work in relation to that as well and what we're hoping to do with this and I think with the regulations that we're bringing forward today is really just to ensure that we have the relevant expertise that, that covers the broad variety of areas that food policy touches as well um, but of course the matters that you raise in relation to the importance of food production and food security I think these are very much strong themes that we've picked up through our Good Food Nation plan as well. And I know that, of course, that will be coming uh, to, to the committee for consideration at some point soon. But I would, of course, encourage all members to make their views known. I attended a cross-party group on food last night uh, that Rhoda Grant chaired, where just picking up the different perspectives on that and the different issues that people see as being important it is our first plan. So, of course, we want to make sure that we get it in as strong a position as possible. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Any other <laughs> members? Rhoda? Just a very quick question on the back of that. Given that the Commission is still to be set up and the plan has been consulted on, what is the Commission's remit 
about the plan? Can they influence what's in the plan? It seems the plan may already be in place before they are. Well, the intention always was to have the Commission established at the same time as the, the final plan would be laid. So that's why the timescales for those sections of the, the Act come into effect at the, the same period of time. But it's important that we bring forward these regulations now to at least start the work of building that Commission uh, so they can help shape what the body will look like in time for that final plan being laid. Um, as I, I set out the cross-party group on food last night, this is, of course, our first iteration of the plan. There will be further reviews and progress reports on that uh, as we proceed and once it's finally laid as well. And the Commission will have a, a critical role in that as well. And also not to forget that once we've delivered our Good Food Nation plan, that will set the direction for the other relevant authorities who have to produce one too, our local authorities and health boards. And, of course, we hope that the Commission would, would help us in that work as well. Okay. Yeah. Jamie Halliker Johnson. Much. Just a very quick point. I mean, I've never been on a committee with so many kind of, um, Highlands and Islands members. So I just wondered if you could comment on how the, uh, you know, how the regions uh, are going to be represented. That this isn't, you know, an approach that that this is an approach that will ensure that islands and, and our more remote and rural areas are represented in this. Uh, do you mean in relation to the, the plan itself? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's obviously separate to the regulations that yeah. we are considering today. I'm more than happy to have a separate discussion with you in relation to that. We want to make sure that first of all in the consultation we undertake on the plan, it's as broad and as far-reaching as possible. That's why we have produced a variety of different materials to make it, first of all, as accessible as possible, because I know the accessibility of the consultation and ensuring it's, it was inclusive as possible was a key theme that came through the committee's scrutiny of that too. Um, we have Commission Nourish who are holding workshops for us in order to enable that, that stronger engagement in ensuring there. And I think they've got workshops across the country, so I'm happy to provide that information to the committee if they haven't seen that already, if that would be helpful. Thanks. And Ariane Burgess. Thanks, Mayor. Um, grateful that the Cabinet Secretary is here today to clarify um, points around this SSI. I'd be interested to understand um, what, um, the, what it means refer by referring to a board, because um, that term is not used in the Good Food Nation Act, and it's my understanding that the chair and a set of commissioners will do more than the standard role of, of a board. So appreciate clarif clarification on that. As you know, we discussed this at length during the Good Food Nation bill process, and the point of the Food Commission is to provide board expertise and understanding of all aspects of the food system to ensure Good Food Nation plans and other policies bring about the fundamental changes that we need. And given that, in what uh, additionally, in what situation would the Scottish Government appoint a member of the Food Commission who is not either representative of the food business sector or third sector bodies or possessing expertise and or experience in the list of food related issues? Well, I would say that in terms of setting this out and the way the approach that we've taken to it is very similar to the broad approach that's been set, uh, that's been established for other commissions and bodies that the Scottish Government has, has set up when you look at Environmental Standards Scotland, um, Consumer Scotland and the Scottish Commission for, for Social Security as well in terms of the, the numbers and uh, uh, the overall approach that we're taking. I'm sorry, I think I would need to be clearer on the last element of your question. I think because what we've set out there is, well, first of all, the matters that we've set out to be taken into consideration in relation to the appointments, are they reflect the matters that are listed in the, the Act itself in sections 1, 6 and 10, 6. So it essentially mirrors the provisions that we have there too. And that is essentially to ensure that we're not limiting ourselves at this period of time. I, I know that the committee will be aware through all the evidence that you took throughout the, the scrutiny of the bill, just how many uh, different representatives, organisations from all, right across uh, civil society in Scotland and across all different policy areas as well um, were interested in the work of the Good Food Nation Plan and the, and the Act itself. So we want to make sure that we can encompass that broad range of expertise within the board members that we appoint. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to preempt that process or the types of expertise or the people that we would be looking to appoint at that stage. I think it's, it's far too early for that. But again, we wanted to just ensure with the regulations we're bringing forward that we are able to have that, that flexibility and reflect the broad range of, of expertise of people who might put themselves forward. Okay, thanks for that. Can I just come back on the board piece, though? 
Could you go into a little bit more detail about what does the reference to the board mean and what do you imagine the commissioners, commissioner, the chair and the commissioners will be doing? I, again, I've set out in relation to in some of the previous responses there what the, what the role of the Commission would be, and, and that's set out in the legislation. And again, set out the timescales there as to you know, why various sections of the Act are going to be commenced at the, the relevant times, and that's to ensure that the Commission is there to enable us to take forward the work in the plan, to help us review and monitor the progress in relation to that as well. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not entirely aware of the, the board reference that you're talking about there, or Lisa, I don't know if you have more information, or, or James? The, the reference to the board is just a way to describe the, the members of the Commission, so the schedule to, to the Act requires the Commission to consist of a member to chair and between two and four other members for it, so the reference to the board simply means okay. the reference to so the members So it's just a the, kind of quick of catch-all yes. way of uh, the, shortening the, sort of the term, yeah, rather than having to say all of that. Yes. Okay, that's really helpful, thanks. Reassuring, I would say, that that, that is. Um, I'd also be interested to understand um, in what situation would the Scottish <coughs> Government appoint only one Commissioner who is representative of the food business or third sector, and only one Commissioner who possesses the experience or expertise on the list? Um, and again, why wouldn't we want all commissioners to fulfil at least one of those criteria? So I understand it's about flexibility, but I just want to understand what you're imagining, what you're... I, I understand that you're trying to create a situation which allows that flexibility to bring all kinds of people in, but I could imagine that in thinking through this SSI, you would have imagined some of the scenarios where that might be the case. I think it's exactly because of... I mean, I don't think we're... Aiming, I don't think we're talking at cross purposes here in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And I think what we've set out here is exactly because we want to try and achieve what you've talked about there and recognising the broad level of experience that can exist. So it's not about these things being mutually exclusive, but for us providing and ensuring that we're taking these matters into consideration. And as I say, they mirror what's in the Act as well, which is, is why we framed it in that way. OK. Thanks for that. Thanks, Convener. If there are no other questions, um, then we move on to the formal consideration of the motion to approve the instrument. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move uh, motion SM, sorry, S6M12052 that the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee recommends that the Scottish Food Commission Appointment Regulations 2024 be approved. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. Does any member wish to debate the motion? Ariane Burgess? A few things on record, convener. So, I was a strong advocate uh, for the inclusion of the Good Food Commission in the Good Food Nation Act, and we have seen examples of strong commissions achieving transformational change, such as the Scottish Land Commission, and pulling together different strands into a whole systems approach, just like the trans, uh, Just Transition Commission. And this is the kind of thing that we absolutely need now in Scotland. But in order to do that, the commission needs the right expertise and experience. The appointment of the chair and commissioners is central to how the culture of the Scottish Food Commission will develop and thus how it carves out its place and reputation for stewarding the Good Food Nation Act and holding national government and relevant authorities to account. And the appointment group will set the tone for how they drive forward the areas of work in particular with respect to the policy coherence and holding ministers to account in terms of how the Good Food Nation Act and the plans impact or is impacted by the plethora of existing and future policies and legislation. As such, it's essential that a group of highly engaged individuals who are comfortable with systems thinking, given the focus of the transforming of our food system, are appointed. And they have to have both the breadth and depth of experience, skills and lived experience of our food system. And it is not desirable that places are reserved for any specific sector or stakeholder group, uh, as all commissioners will need to be able to consider the impact on multi-stakeholder and public groups and be skilled in understanding the tensions, power dynamics and interests at play. And then on specifically on the text in the Good Food Nation Act schedule, um, the part about appointing commissioners, option three, is the weaker of the three and is quite oddly worded, and I have concerns about what it means and how skills and expertise will be established and prioritised within recruitment. And I can understand the desire to keep it broad, 
but it is important to ensure appropriate skills and experience, and there will be core skills and competencies that appointed commissioners will need, and it will be worth checking how this will be managed through the person specification appointments process. The key is that those skills and competencies um, should not be dependent on sectorial expertise or connections of a candidate or an appointed commissioner, should not be appointed to represent particular interest groups. And I will vote for the, I, I will um, go ahead with the secondary legislation, but I strongly encourage the Scottish Government to go further. Not only should the Scottish Government consider the desirability of the board, including one member who fills the criteria set out, they should consider how much more effective the Commission will be if all members fulfil that criteria. The Food Commission will not have an easy job. Our country is not well served by the way our food system currently operates. It's letting down producers consumer and consumers alike and putting pressure on our healthcare system and our environment. But if the Food Commission has the right expertise and the know-how to put that into practice, then instead of contributing to problems, our food system can contribute to solutions, helping us to reach net zero, improve health and well-being, strengthen national food security and local economies, provide good jobs, and ensure that everyone in Scotland can afford, afford and enjoy the world-class food produced in our good food nation. Thank you. Our members have a contribution to make to the debate. Emma. Thank you. Thanks, convener. It's just as I'm thinking of my original questions to the Cabinet Secretary, um, the Scottish Food Commission regulations 2024 stem from the Good Food Nation Act, and that is really important that we're trying to ensure a healthy nation underpinned by good diets as set out in the Act. And I'm interested in that we pursue that the core values of the Food Commission will be to support Scottish agriculture and food production and ensure that Scottish food uh, security and that the Food Commission will work closely with our valued Scottish farmers. I'd like to make sure we see that as we progress. No, could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make any final comments? Uh, just to say that I very much acknowledge the interest of the committee and the points that have, that have been raised by the, the members of the committee today. I think it's within all our best interests, and I think we all share the same aim of what we want the Good Food Nation uh, Act and the plans that we produce to achieve, as well as what we hope the, the Scottish uh, Food Commission can help us achieve as part of that as well. So I very much welcome the interventions that have been made today. Thank you. Is the committee content to recommend approval of the instrument? Yes. 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 Finally, is the committee content to delegate authority to me to sign off our report on the instrument? Yes. Yes. That completes our consideration of the instrument. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials for attending. I will now suspend the meeting briefly to allow a change of officials. Our third item of business this morning is consideration of a negative SSI, the Seafish Prohibition of Fish on Fishing, Firth of Clyde Order 2024. I welcome back to the meeting Mary Goujon and her officials, Alan Gibb, Chief Negotiator for International Fisheries, and Dr Kobe, Kobe Needle, Chief Fisheries Advisor for Scotland. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and again, thank you for inviting me to, to give evidence on the, uh, the motion before us today. This order was laid on Thursday, the 11th of January, and I note that there have been some letters exchanged between the then Minister for Energy and Environment, Julian Martin, uh, with some follow-up questions. Like the previous order, what we're setting out today seeks to maximise protection of spawning cod and the habitat 
habitats in which they are likely to spawn by prohibiting all fishing activity within two specific areas of the Firth of Clyde during the spawning season. Disturbance is a key feature here, and that is why the previous exemptions were removed in the 2022 order, helping deliver the maximum protection possible. I do acknowledge that these closures have a short-term impact on some local fishers. However, this action is necessary to allow the stock to replenish, which will ultimately be beneficial for fishing interests. This is a complex issue, and I appreciate that it has elicited some strong feelings in the local area. That is why, following a consultation last year and in the lead-up to this closure, my officials have been working with local fishers. And in addition to this, on the 31st of January, the then Minister for Energy and Environment met with the Clyde Fishermen's Association. At this meeting, the government's commitment to work in partnership with the CFA and to undertake additional research during this closure period was underlined. The revised closure areas are a pragmatic and evidence-based solution which reflect our commitment to protect spawning cod whilst minimising socio-economic impacts on coastal communities. Ultimately, we do have a duty to balance environmental and economic issues. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that committee members may have. Thank you. Uh, um, can I kick off with um, the sort of evidence base around the, the COD stocks? I mean, the ministers reiterated that the evidence that was reviewed to inform the closure is the same evidence that was used in the, in the previous 2022 order. Um, and uh, it, the, the Minister's response to the Committee's letter doesn't indicate that it has reviewed any wider evidence on the Clyde inshore stock. So I wonder if you could give a bit more information about um, the evidence that's been used on this occasion. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to set out some initial comments, and then I don't know if uh, Kobe would like to come in on the back of that as well. We are basing it on the same evidence because that is essentially the best scientific evidence uh, which is uh, available to, to us and which to base that decision as well. Of course, it has been a couple of years since I last came to the committee in relation to this order. We've had the, the monitoring work that's taken place in that time, which I think the results of that have been set out in the information to the committee uh, by the, the previous minister, Gillian Martin, in relation to that and what that found, and that there was, I think, very few spawning cod actually found in relation to that in the, in the, uh, as a result of the closure, which could suggest a couple of different things and could indicate that the closure that we have is ultimately in the right place. But I think coming back to the initial point, it is, we are still basing it on the best scientific uh, available, uh, evidence available to us, uh, which is why that, that work still stands. You will appreciate that some of, some of the representations we have received is about the, the, the impact being disproportionate on a smaller number of, of fishers, as you have you've pointed out. But in terms of uh, evidence, that, um, could you indicate if the uh, Marine Directorate has taken account of um, PhD research that has been undertaken at Strathclyde University, um, uh, being supervised by Professor Mike Heath? Uh, there was an abstract of that research that was sent to the Marine Directorate, and I wonder how much uh, account that uh, you know, has been taken of that information. Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. With that, I'll ask Kobe to comment on that, on that question. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so the Strathclyde assessment model is one that we're involved with. We uh, co-supervise the student who is working on that assessment model. It's not yet been published. I believe she has only just um, recently submitted her thesis, so there's no been, there hasn't been any peer review, um, any external peer review or, or internal peer review of that particular model. So. Um, I would argue we remain in a position of not having a Clyde-specific stock assessment for cod. Um, the wider northern shelf cod assessment, and um, specifically the northwestern substock thereof, uh, is positive and has led to the, a change in management. Um, but ISIS, the, the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, who developed that assessment, have been very clear that um, the Clyde and other inshore areas around Scotland can't be assessed as a separate stock due to, currently due to lack of data. So um, I think it is possible that the Clyde area is recovering in a similar way to what we see in the northwestern substock of the northern shelf cod stock. It is also possible that the ongoing closure um, has a positive effect uh, on this. We have, we have, it's not the only spawn enclosure we have. We have 10 others in the North Sea. Uh, and you could argue that the, um, these management measures, along with you know, good work by the fishing industry and um, positive environmental signals, uh, have a positive effect on, on the cod stock. So I would think, it would, it, for me, it wouldn't be appropriate to remove the spawning protections on cod at this early stage of, of cod recovery. Thank you. Alistair Allen. 
Thank you, Convener. I appreciate this is a supplementary, but I wonder if I could split this into two bits, if that's okay. Um, so my first question was um, around the the science um, in uh, the Irish Sea, and I appreciate obviously the, the connections and similarities between the Firth of Clyde stock and the, the or uh, cod rather, and those in the Irish Sea. Um, can I just ask what, what data has been drawn from the Irish Sea, if any, and has that been applied in the, the, the Clyde area? About, about, about um, stocks and their viability? So the Irish Sea cod is currently viewed by ISIS again as a, as a separate stock from, um, from the west coast of, of Scotland cod and also from the Clyde cod, which is, is currently assessed as part of the west of Scotland um, stock structure. Um, so you know, the Irish Sea is treated as, as quite separate. Um, the extent to which Irish Sea cod are linked with Clyde cod, and the extent to which Clyde cod are linked with the West of Scotland cod is, is currently unclear. Um, and I think in any case, it doesn't. What, you know, the, the, the specific stock structure that we have in that area um, doesn't particularly make much of a difference because we don't have the data to enable us to treat Clyde cod separately from the cod to the south or to the north. Uh, we, just, we, we don't have the information that would enable us to do that. So I think on, on this basis, the most pragmatic and, and, and defensible position is to treat cloud cod as, as ISIS do, which is part of the wider northwestern substock of Northern Shelf, um, and proceed on that basis. Thank you, Matt. My other point was, um, or my other question was, was looking at the cod box. I wonder if you could say something about um, the preferred spawning grounds in terms of the kind of seabed we're talking about, whether we're talking about sandy mud or muddy sand or sand. Um, and whether in identifying areas with those types of seabed, the precautionary principle has been applied, or what the thinking was around that? So, uh, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so the, the published literature, the peer-reviewed published literature on cod spawning is quite clear that they prefer uh, gravelly, sandy, you know, gravelly, sandy areas. Um, the original. Clyde cod closure that we had prior to um, the last time I appeared before this committee was uh, was much wider and included areas of muddy um, muddy substrate that we know cod will not spawn on. Um, the reason for that is that male cod um, develop what's known as leks, which are, are small areas of the seabed that they sort of guard against other males, and then they, they use vocalizations to attract females to those areas. So they need a specific type of substrate in order to do this. Um, so what we did when developing this new closure was to look at the um, substrate information that we have and, and choose those areas which are, are rougher substrates, so gravelly, sand, um, all the way up to gravel and, and cobbles, in fact. Uh, and we've left, we've left the, the muddy area um, free of, of, of these restrictions. Where the precautionary principle comes in, I guess, is that we did um, uh, allow for a small buffer zone around what we would consider to be prime um, cod spawning habitat, just to ensure that there's, there's no transgressions into that. Because, because the, you know, it's, the, the, they, may, they may be spawning where we think they may be spawning, or they may be spawning in a slightly different area. So it's just to ensure that um, they have that sort of protection. Thank you. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested in other issues that might impact the spawning of cod, um, climate change, other predation, other uh, activities that, um, other than disturbance of the seabed. One of my local uh, fishermen says he is witnessing more sea bass in the northern waters, so I'm wondering about the impact of climate change or those other activities that might affect spawning. If I could just come in briefly on that before I, I, I turn to Alan, who could provide a, a bit more of the, the detail in relation to that. And I think some of the changes uh, that we see precisely because of the, the issues that you've raised as well. I think I would just want to briefly make the point too that uh, we are, there are other measures in place and other changes that have been developed to try and uh, well, protect spawning cod as, as much as possible, which Alan may be able to talk to in terms of uh, changing the size of, of mesh panels and engine sizes of vessels, because we want to make sure that we're minimising disturbance as much as possible and ensuring that we're, uh, we're, we're not catching what, we're, what we shouldn't be catching. But um, I'll hand over to Alan, who can provide some more of the detail. Yeah, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think it's important to separate the two issues. The, the issue of um, impact on the cod, cod as a species in the cod stock, um, and the impact on that 
um, that species when it's carrying out an activity which is spawning or trying to spawn. So we're trying to give it um, the maximum protection when it's spawning, and the evidence suggests that disturbance is what it needs protected from up to 10 metres from the seabed. But broadly speaking, um, for, the, for the broader question about um, impacts on cod, such as climate, environment and so forth, um, it's hard, to be, it's hard to be definitive, but I think, yes, it looks like there are environmental factors at play. The cod stocks are, um, have moved a little bit further north, it would appear. Um, we're sitting here today, two years on, uh, and we've pretty much had a transformational set of advice for cod in terms of recovery. The biomass has almost doubled. It's been amazing. We have no zero tack advice anymore. Um, it's a fantastic turnaround. And I think, um, and Kobe alluded to it, but we have um, 10 identical measures in the North Sea. We have real-time closures when there's lots of juvenile cod uh, identified. We have real-time reporting. We have move-on provisions. We have increased mesh size. Depending on the size of your vessel, you have to have a 200 millimetre square mesh panel or a 300 millimetre square mesh panel, all designed um, to increase um, protection for cod and other gadoids uh, of the juvenile. And it would be highly improbable not to suspect that those measures, including the seasonal closure, haven't contributed to what's been a transform transformational change in the states of the cod stocks. Okay. Can I just ask the, what the impact would be then? You know, how does how does something like hand diving uh, for scallops? How does that impact on you know the slow impact on uh, the spawning areas? I think because ultimately this is about uh, as. Uh, Alan had set out there about, and I th from the, uh, we touched on the scientific evidence that's available, that it's any disturbance to the seabed uh, can disrupt uh, uh, spawning cod. We want to make sure we're protecting spawning cod as much as possible, which is why there are no exemptions in place for this closure in line with the, the previous couple of years. Okay. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Thank you. Um, can I just push you a wee bit on the previous answer about um, juvenile cod being discarded by the prone fishery trawling industry? The evidence we've received suggests that the closure approach actually is the wrong approach and that most cod are being caught up. Um, juvenile cod are being called, caught up in trawling. What evidence do you have that actually that's not the case and that um, the, the gear used is allowing them to escape. It just seems to me that this is not really based on scientific evidence as such, and things like creelers and divers, who we know have very little impact, are being caught up in a closure um, that probably isn't going to have the impact we're looking for. Um, with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Alan Hill coming in on that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think the issue here is um, we're talking about two completely different issues. So juvenile cod don't spawn. They're too young. You have to be a certain I'm age. Sorry, I, I, no, I, I wasn't meaning they were. But is, the, uh, is that not the impact on the cod stocks that they're not getting to adulthood? So um, that's why we've increased selectivity. So um, in the Clyde, for example, the Nephrop yeah. fleet, um, there used to be a 70 millimetre cod end. It's now 80 with increased square mesh panels. Very much trying to do that. That's why we have juvenile real-time closure schemes in place. Yes, there can be bycatches. We try our hardest to, to minimise that in that sense. Um, so in terms of allowing, you've, you've got two You've got two focuses as a, as a fisheries manager. You've got protection of juvenile to try and allow them to grow up, to be adults, to spawn. But you've also then got the duty to protect the adults who can spawn to then create the juveniles. And, and it's the mix of those, of those two um, elements. And the, the thing on the spawning is all the evidence is you have to stop disturbance to allow the spawning to take place. Um, I think as officials, certainly I, I'm not sitting here saying a diver or a, or a creel on the seabed has the same impact as a trawler. Of course it doesn't. What we're saying is that it's about disturbance. We have a local fisher in his area says that there's over between four and 5,000 creels in, in the would be deployed. And there's several local fishers in the area. Every time you pull a creel up from the seabed, it drags across the seabed before it lifts. So, Although it's not the same level of disturbance, many, many, many thousands of creels are pulled up and shot down every day. Cumulatively, that creates a significant amount of disturbance, and that's what we're trying to avoid and give the protection for the cod. Okay. Ariane, 
Th thanks. Thanks, Convener. Uh, so from the committee papers, the advice from the committee's fisheries advisor and stakeholder evidence sent to the committee over the last few days is very clear that the SSI before us is, is necessary but not sufficient to restore the Clyde cod stock. And as the convener said, we are all aware of the PhD um, work on the Clyde stock assessment being supervised by the Marine Director and Strathclyde University. And Professor Paul Fernandez, this is the committee's fisheries scientific advisor, he says that an assessment like this is necessary in order to properly manage the Clyde stock and that peer review is not essential for using um, uh, to, for using it to inform policy. So I, I would, um, I think as you hear uh, all the comments, um, many of the comments or questions today is a bit of a concern around the scientific evidence and I would appreciate a commitment from the government uh, in relationship to this SSI that the PhD work is shared, it is a draft, I understand that, but that that is shared. Um, so that's the Marine Directorate and Professor Mike Heath at Strathclyde University work um, on the state of the stock and the recommendations of recovery and that that is shared with the committee. I would also appreciate it if um, there's a commitment to using the latest science, including that PhD, uh, when uh, uh, SSIs like this are being developed, um, the, uh, in particular the replacement one to the Clyde Cod Closures SSI from 2026 onward. Uh, and also I'd appreciate um, if the um, uh, Scottish Government, the Marine Directorate, begins scoping additional measures to protect the stock, especially bycatch reduction, uh, as the latest science uh, has said, um, that this is the main pressure. There were quite a few points in that. I'd be happy to follow up in relation to some of those. I think in relation to, to sharing the PhD work, I mean, that's something I would have to take advice on, given uh, any potential stage that it's at. Uh, I, I do think uh, having a peer review process is important, though. I think, you know, I could uh, quite easily appear at committee and be criticised for, you know, using an evidence base where, you know, that, that process hasn't been taking place either. But I think um, I, rather than commit to that today, that's something I'm happy to, to follow up on, and I would need to take further advice on that. Okay, and sorry, I think Alan would like to come in on that point too. Um, just, just to offer some reassurance on the on the last point I think you made around the um, the, the need for continuing and, and improving protection, selectivity, and so forth. So, just just to highlight two two pieces of work, um, the um, in the UK um, EU Norway trilateral, we we collectively manage the northern um, shelf stock. Um, there's been an agreement there to review and. Um, consider the appropriateness of all current measures in place, and that will include um, the 11, including the Clyde season closure, the 10 in the North Sea, again, all identical. Um, have we got them in the right place? Are they doing the right thing? As well as mesh size and so forth, so that, that review will be going at an international level. Domestically, you'll be aware, as, as committee members, of the future fisheries management strategy, and in particular the future catching policy where work is ongoing with a whole range of stakeholders uh, on exactly that issue around um, the need to have increased or changed technical measures, which is likely to be increased selectivity, increased uh, mesh size without, without prejudging the outcome of those, of those discussions. So there's a significant amount of work uh, in that direction uh, underway. OK. Can I come back in? Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so I really appreciate um, knowing about that work. Uh, I just also wanted to pick up on a point that um, Alan Gibb, you pointed out about the, the anecdotal uh, uh, mention of a, um, somebody who works at I think Creels in that area, a fisher in that area, um, and, and the um, point you made that there's four to five thousand Creels being um, deployed. I don't know what the right word is, but dropped um, every day or uh, frequently. Um, I, I'd really appreciate some evidence on that because I do remember we were here maybe last year or the year before and you talked about those staggering numbers and I, I've, I've kind of had other conversations with other people that that would be impossible unless it's cumulative. And um, So I'd like some evidence on that for the committee and also I would be interested in uh, understanding what the government is doing and looking into and what I understand that creelers, there are creelers there uh, who are working um, 
on the West Coast, not necessarily in the Clyde, who are calling to actually uh, have some kind of capping limit on what they can deploy. And I think that's something that we need to be actually really taking on board. I think it's a very reasonable um, request that there's a cap so that there's enough to share between everybody. And meanwhile, we get proper recovery and we're... Um, uh, recovery of stocks and, and all that, so, because what we're doing here today, we are trying to ensure that there is fisheries for 30 years, 100 years from now, that Scotland does actually have fishing as part of what we, are, we say is part of our culture. So um, I just would like to get a bit more information from the Scottish Government and Marine Director around um, that evidence around the number of creoles being deployed in uh, the Clyde in that area, in the Codbox area, but also what work's being done in terms of um, looking into what creelers are calling for in terms of a cap. Mm -hmm. I think, just to take your last point first, I think, but before Alan might want to come in, there is a specific work going on in relation to now, I think, identifying you know, what we've been hearing from fishers about the different pressures that are there. That's something that I'd be happy to follow up with the committee and provide more information on. And I think that's work that's been taken through the, the FMAC uh, Inshore group in relation to that. So I can provide more information there. But, uh, Alan. Um, thank you. And on the, on the two points that I... So, I, so I, as an individual, an official, wouldn't sit here and just um, suggest there's 4,000, 5,000, you know, that, um, that is a, a direct quote from a fisherman. I think he, um, was a, a, he um, had an article in the newspaper and as well as wrote into me. Um, my understanding, to, to, be, to be fair, my understanding is he talks about in his area, I think it's him and two other boats, so cumulatively there would be two, three boats um, together doing that. That's about right. You know, every single fleet of creels, you know, can number 50 to 75 you know, and they haul numerous fleets each day, um, and there will be more fishermen. So the many, many thousands is, is, you know, factually accurate. What we don't know is how many creels there are in the water. That's true. And it's, in my personal opinion, it's bound to be a staggering number. And um, we did have a consultation on capping creel limits, and the fishermen themselves um, they decided they didn't want that. A couple of areas said they might like to do something locally, but that consultation was overwhelmingly, no, we don't want a cap. Attitudes, and attitudes may have changed um, now, and again, that will form part of the discussion of the future catching policy, I'm sure, as to um, when we come out and all these things, whether that's, that's an appropriate thing. Um, I don't have a view on whether a cap's appropriate. I do think an understanding of how many creels are in the water would be invaluable for fisheries management, yes. And, and, and do you have a sense of how the Marine Directorate could actually take forward work on, on understanding how many? I mean, I know there's like remote technology now available. Um, I think I actually maybe forwarded information about that to the Marine Directorate, uh, and that was more about losing things, losing gear. But if we've got tracking um, equipment that can keep us um, from losing gear and that causing the marine litter problem, that also would help us with in terms of understanding the number of creels in the water. What, what could we do? What, what do we need some policy? What could we actually do in order to get that understanding? Because again, we're having to make decisions based on not really having the full picture. I, I think we just want to point to a couple of initiatives that, that are other way, uh, that are underway at the moment that we'd be looking to take learning from in relation to um, projects in the Outer Hebrides and Mull, which are, are you know quite targeted and looking at looking at issues around that, which I think we can take some more learning from. And I think as part of this work as we go forward, I think critical to that for me is ensuring that we're working with our, uh, our our fishers as we progress that work and through our regional inshore fisheries groups too. But I'll in, you know, more information, and I think Kobe also want to come back in on uh, a previous point um, you would raised as well. So, so just on that very technical point, um, it's about proportionality in my mind, of course, that there's modern technology. You can, the, a lot of these boats are very small boats, under 10 metres, but you could have, for example, a barcode reader and the barcode on the creel, as the creel comes up, it goes over the barcode reader and it's counted and every, every creel, you would make a rule that every creel had to have a marking and a barcode reader. But that's a huge undertaking for several thousand creel boats to be doing, and I'm not sure about the cost of all that. Um, in terms, of, yeah, we have over four and a half thousand uh, uh, boats in our uh, two and a half thousand boats in our fleet. The vast majority are, are, are small, under under ten inshore boats, creel boats. Um, so that would be a huge undertaking, but not impossible. So it'd be about proportionality. The challenge I, I would also people often think that this is straightforward. Okay, let's just do that. But actually. How do you know if a creel has the barcode on it because it's under the water? 
and unless you can check every single creel as a, as a monitoring, which you can't, and if you start hauling people's creels, you have to be able to show that you haven't disturbed, caused damage, and put them back exactly as you found them, which is nearly impossible. Um, so the technology does exist. We would need to just balance that with um, with the proportionality, I, I would suggest. Um, but again, it's something that I know the directorate uh, officials are looking at. Okay. Um, just on, on another point, so, um, Cabinet Secretary, you pointed to a couple of learning projects in Mull and the Western Isles. It would be, it'd be uh, really appreciated. It, it, I know that the Marine Director is very busy with lots of things, and I think it's challenging for the committee to really understand all of the work and all of the bits of the puzzle. And we come at little bits when there's an SSI or a piece of work that, that comes to committee. But I think for us to be able to contribute well in the scrutiny of, of the work, it would be good to understand some of the elements that you're working on that contribute to a fuller picture. So I, I think I would uh, appreciate some more information on those initiatives and, and what you're seeking to get from them. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, in terms broadly, what they're trying to look at is it's about that working together and managing that competition for space. And I think where we've had those pilots, they have been operating well. But again, I'm more than happy to follow up with more detail on those Thanks. projects. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Uh, just on a point that actually uh, that Ari Andres there, I mean, the Bria states that, uh, uh, amongst other things, additional scientific data gathering in the Clyde region would be beneficial, yet under current resource constraints this is not possible. I mean, the Cabinet Secretary will recall that I've raised the issue mm -hmm. about uh, resource, Marine Director <coughs> resource in the past, so I wonder if you could say something about that. Uh, yes, I'm happy to provide more information. And I think, the, uh, again, I've referred to Gillian Martin when she was in her post as Minister for Energy and Environment, had uh, set out some more information to the committee in relation to that, where we've actually set out an additional three strands of work that we're looking to take forward in relation to the, the, the evidence gathering and the monitoring as well. And um, we have committed to resourcing that and taking that work forward. Thank you. Eleanor Whittam. Convener. Um, and just actually following on from the, the question that the convener has just posed, like many others, I am um, interested in understanding how the Scottish Government and the Marine Directorate um, is going to resolve the data um, deficiencies. And in that letter back to the committee on the, the 8th of February, there was those three strands um, outlined um, in terms of enhanced observer coverage, passive acoustic monitoring um, and science presence on compliance vessels. I'm really um, interested in understanding how we move firmly into a co-management principle sphere, where we actually are really working collectively with our fishers, who have a huge amount of vast knowledge of the area that they work in, and they also have an interest in ensuring that their, you know, the, the bedrock of the, the marine environment is protected, as all of us. You know, that's a key plank in our, our planet's ecosystem, but obviously it's, it's their livelihood. So given the financial pressures that the Marine Directorate is under, um, I'm wondering, you know, you've already alluded to the fact that you've had meetings with um, the CFA, um, and hopefully with the Creelers Federation as well. I'm really interested in wondering how do we ensure that we involve the industry um, in, in developing shared scientific data? Obviously, there's always going to be vested interest in different um, aspects of this. But I think um, given the fact that we don't have uh, a shared understanding in scientific data at the moment, how can we involve them going forward meaningfully? Yeah, you're absolutely you're absolutely right in relation to that. And I think that there's a, a couple of different forums I think I'd want to point to. I mean, I think one really important forum that we have to take forward and ensure that we have that engagement with our fishers across the board is the, the FMAT group as well. There are a number of subgroups within that. Uh, I mentioned the, the inshore fisheries subgroup and the, some of the work that they're looking to take forward. So that's a really important forum for us for engagement uh, right across the piece. But I think I, I would also just point to, you know, as, as I alluded to there, the, the three strands of work which you, you highlighted as well. And I think what's been important for us is ensuring that we are engaging, um, particularly with the CFA, in, in relation to that. And I really appreciate, I think, the constructive way in which they, they come forward um, and very much want to, to work with us, because I think it is within all our best interests to ensure that uh, we're, we're working from the, the same basis and we can involve them in that process. So I think that they have, uh, I'm sure either Alan or Kobe want to come in 
I think Hobie, you want to come in with more information on a specific point. Um, but I think that taking that work forward with them is going to be important. And I think one of the strands of work where we're talking about the, the science presence and having that on the, the MPVs, we're having discussions with the CFA about how they could potentially be uh, involved in some of that work too. Um, so I know that after the meeting that the Minister had had, there have been follow-up discussions with officials as well in relation to that, because you do raise a really important point. But I think, Kobe, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thanks, Cabinet Secretary. So just on the two of the strands that you mentioned, the, we, we, do, we are allowing for enhanced observer coverage in the Clyde in this quarter. So we'd normally ha that would normally be part of our randomly selected vessels uh, on the West Coast anyway. So we do have an, a, a history of observer coverage in the Clyde, but where we've been able to move resources around a bit and enhance that for quarter one. The other one is that you mentioned the passive acoustic monitors, which are... Um, potentially very useful devices for determining where cod are spawning because they have this vocalization and you can, you can hear them um, from quite a long way away. So one of, the, one of those monitors is being placed just south of Arran um, and that was going in anyway uh, as, as part of another piece of work that we're doing. But the second one, we, we had a position determined and in consultation with the CFA, um, we actually decided to move it to a different place uh, within that southern closure. Um, one of the skippers said, well, you never see you know, see spawning cod where you think that uh, monitor is going to go, so here's a better place to put it. So that, I think that's an example of where we're working with local fishermen to try and really, you know, to try and understand where specifically where cod are spawning and whether we're protecting the, the correct areas. Currently, we think we do on the basis of published literature and the substrate information that we have, but we can always refine that that understanding. So uh, local fishermen know the area um, extremely well, so that's where we, we can utilise that information to try and improve these management measures. I'm sorry if I could just bring Alan in as well. Thank you, but you responded to a point. Yeah, I think it, it was just a general point um, around lots of discussion around Clyde stocks, Clyde cod, Clyde fish stocks. Um, the Clyde isn't unique. Um, it's not different. Um, fish don't know about lines on maps, so the Clyde and the Irish Sea um, quite close. There might be, there may be, it's probable that some of the cod that are in the Clyde, as opposed to Clyde cod, are genetically linked to the Irish Sea stock. That's what happened in the west coast in the North Sea, and the benchmarking um, <coughs> turned out that there's quite a lot of intermixing, um, same stock, but a lot of intermixing between the two areas. Um, we have the Firth of Forth, we have the Cromarty Firth, Firth of Clyde. You know, the fisheries are broadly the same in there. Um, so it, there, aren't a, there isn't a standalone Clyde set of stocks and species in there at all. It's part of the broader West of Scotland stock. They come and go, pelagic fish will migrate in and out of the Clyde, small seeth will stay there and when they're small and then go offshore when they're, when they're, a, when they're, when they're grown up bigger. Um, so it's just this kind of thing about, oh, let's manage the Clyde stocks in the Clyde. There, there aren't, that, that, isn't, that isn't right. There's fish stocks and some of those stocks are to be found in the Clyde. And I think it's important that we recognise the difference there. Can I just come back in yeah. briefly? Um, I think, Alan, you've made a, a really important point there, because I think that alludes to what Emma Harper um, said earlier. If we think about the climatic change as well, where we have fish that are moving for, for climate reasons too. So it's going to be very difficult to try and manage fish to stay in one area without all of the other pressures actually influencing fish behaviour and, and where they're going to go. So I think going forward for us to actually understand what the science tells us is happening under, under, you know, under the surface of the, the sea is going to be really important. And I think that shared scientific data that our fishers and our marine director are actually going to come to together, um, I think is going to be really, really important for us. Johnson. Thank you very much, convener. Um, before I touch, I was going to talk about some of the kind of financial impacts, but before I do it, can I just ask regards to the evidence? Um, the evidence that was used in the previous 2022 order, when was that from? When was that conducted? Oh, sorry, Kobe. Um, so the evidence is uh, that's mostly based on published literature, which uh, explains, is very clear on how, how cod spawn and where they would like to spawn or, or where, where, where they can spawn. And we combine that with... Um, substrate data from the British Geographical Survey, I believe. Um, so so that, that's just an, an ongoing data set that exists. So, so, so none of that evidence there is based on directly on fish numbers or 
um, anything like that. That's simply just on evidence that you wouldn't expect to change. So that, that data itself is like uh, the data that you used for the pre previous 2022 order and you've used for this order isn't likely to change any time soon because it's not actually based on fish numbers. Uh, well, it, it, I'm sure Kobe can talk more in relation to that and how it's actually based, but I mean, the whole reason that we're bringing forward this order is to protect spawning cod in the areas where they are most likely uh, where that activity is going to take place. Um, sorry, Dr. Flesh, more uh, you want it, to... It's, it's difficult to, to develop new information on spawning cod because in order to, in order to find spawning cod, you would... Um, it, within the spawning area, you would have to kill them, essentially. And that's something we're trying to avoid. It's, it's disturbance of spawning cod that we're specifically trying to avoid. So the measures that we're looking at, these, these three strands of measures, um, the, the observer program and the um, scientific presence on the uh, protection vessels, they will be covering cod uh, out with the, the closure to be fair, but then the, the passive acoustic monitors that we have, this is a, a non-invasive, non-lethal, non essentially, way of trying to determine where cod are spawning. So um, we're quite optimistic that that will, that will give us a lot of information that we don't currently have. Okay. Oh, I think th that would certainly be, be interested. I mean, in, in a previous role that I did a, a meeting with fishermen, there always used to be a great frustration with the scientific evidence mainly because they didn't agree with it, because what they were seeing were, were decent stock numbers, and ISIS at the time was saying, um, you know, no, um, these, are, the, the, these, um, these areas are uh, under threat. But that's not what we can do with this data. This data is about the most likely places for cod to be spawning, what we know. And as I say, so unless these new monitoring um, ways come in, that, that data isn't going to change necessarily. Okay. Um, can I just, uh, if, if I can look at the um, financial impact of the closures, um, the minister, or the previous minister's uh, response states the Scottish Government isn't condition, uh, considering any additional financial support schemes uh, related to this closure, um, or, uh, certainly for vessels that can't um, fish in other areas. But there obviously is um, financial implications. Can you kind of give the reasons behind that? Again, I, th I think we've set that out previously, that uh, I understand that there is that impact for that, that short period of time. Um, but I, again, we don't implement such measures when we have other closures or in, when it comes to our marine protected area as well, which is why we haven't offered and we haven't offered previously, and we haven't changed that position this time round when it comes to, to compensation for that. But you, you recognise that there are implications, um, and there may not be alternatives that are available for other areas where there are closures? Uh, yes, I, uh, yes we, do, we do appreciate that and we do recognise that as well as, as we have stated before previously. I know that for some they can move elsewhere during the, the period of the closure. It is a short term closure but of course that's not the same for everyone across the board and there, there is that impact there. Um, but again for the reasons I've already set out, I mean we're not intending to change that position. Okay. Um, the, uh, Clyde Fishermen's Association Secretary Elaine White said the ban uh, will have a devastating impact on fishermen. Um, she, she said, I'm quoting, uh, financially the closure has had a massive impact. We will have mobile boats that have lost areas, but more specifically, more significantly, we have had creel boats that have completely lost their areas and which have no other option to go anywhere. I mean, then they don't have other options. You're essentially asking them to stop their business for this period. Could there not be more consideration given to uh, the impact on them? Uh, again, I appreciate your point as well, and this was something we discussed at length when we'd had the, the previous order for, for closure over the course of the past couple of years. Um, uh, again, and as I've, as I've highlighted, while some people can move elsewhere, I know that that's not possible for everyone, but uh, again, we, ha we haven't changed our position this time round. Okay. I, I mean, could you recognise how frustrating it will be for uh, fishers who uh, are seeing their businesses essentially put on pause, but without the evidence necessary to, um, to do that or the relevant evidence. I know that you've made a commitment to uh, looking at more ways of collecting data, but at the moment that isn't, that isn't in place. Can you understand how frustrating that will be? Uh, I absolutely do, and I think that's why I, I, I intimated that in my, my opening comments to the committee, and I know that this has elicited a really uh, strong feeling, uh, as it did the, the last time round too, but I think that that's where it's important, the, the work that we've agreed to take forward. And, uh, you know, as I also said in my opening remarks, all of this is about that 
that, that balance that we have to try and strike between um, protecting spawning cod, taking these uh, environmental measures, and then balancing that, of course, with the, with the economic impact that, that that has too. None of these are, are easy decisions to make at all, but ultimately we are, are doing this which, and, and taking these decisions uh, to try and ensure that we are in, encouraging uh, the, the restoration of the, this stock and, and, and protecting that spawning cod as much as possible. And I hope that with the other work that we've set out, and of course it's continuing to engage with the likes of the, the CFA as well as we take that forward, that we can continually look to improve that evidence base that we do have. But as it stands at the moment, we do base the decisions that we take on the best available scientific evidence that we have. Okay. The Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation um, has obviously expressed its disappointment. You, will you be aware of the um, lack of exemptions? Is that something, if you're not going to look at any um, a kind of financial uh, support going forward, but in future years, are, you, uh, is, uh, are exemptions more likely to be something you would consider um, where you can, particularly if the scientific data improves? Uh, well, that's the thing. I, I'm not going to prejudge a position that could be taken in a couple of years' time as well, but I think that, as with anything, we've got to continue monitoring and looking at that. So the position this time round might not be the same in a couple of years' time, but I think we really need to see what emerges over the course of the, the closure for the next couple of years. And just, just, just last year, because I mean, we've all talked, and, and I think everybody agree, and, and, and your officials have said, you know, this is about working with, with, the, sect, with the sector. Um, I mean, do you feel that the sector has confidence in the discussions they're having with you, that they're, they're not just being talked to and they're actually being worked with for the future? I know when it comes to decisions like this, it is always going to be really challenging. There is no getting around that because I know that um, some would like to see exemptions in place, as there had been in previous years before the, the last time we brought the, the order before committee. So, of course, given the impact that, that the closure does have on people's businesses, I mean, none of these decisions are, are taken lightly in relation to that at all. You know, I talked about the balance we have to try and get between you know, the environment and the economy and getting all of that right. But of course, when you are telling people to stop fishing in a particular area and that impacts their business, there's no getting around that that is a really difficult decision, um, as well as being uh, difficult for them financially as well. But again, I think that's where just continuing that engagement with the, the likes of, of, of CFA, ensuring we very much want them to be part of that, that process and the work that we're taking forward as well, that we can continue to work together in that vein and then hopefully provide more of an evidence base going forward. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Camilla. I've got a couple of supplementaries. One, the first from Ariane Burgess and then Rhoda Grant. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, the Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust, otherwise known as SIFT, they wrote in their response to the 2024 to 25 spawning closure <coughs> consultation that there is a measurable economic cost of prohibiting creeling within the closed area without a concomitant concomitantly measurable benefit to the resident cod stocks, and that's, that's evidence they have. Um, if including creeling in the closure makes very little difference to cod stocks, why not allow <coughs> creeling to support the economic benefit while focusing management measures where they will make a big difference, for example, by minimising bycatch from nephrops, and tra ne nephrops trawling? I think there are specific issues in relation to that, that piece of work that I, I think Alan will want to come, out, come in on in a moment as well. But I think I would just come back to the point that Alan had made previously in relation to, you know, when you look at these different, uh, different methods of, of fishing in isolation, yeah, they wouldn't have much impact and their impact is very different between the different uh, fishing methods. But of course, it's the collective nature of what that means uh, in creeling. And, uh, you know, we've talked about what varying different numbers of creels could look like in the hauling and the disturbance that that could cause on the seabed. So again, that's why it comes back to the, the decision that we've taken as well. But Alan, are there specific points you want to come in in relation to that? Uh, um, not much, to be honest. I, I'm not sure what evidence um, SIF, SIF claim they have, but you know, creels actually, we you know do catch cod. Um, you know that, that's well documented uh, that happens. But but I accept, as the cabinet secretary said, um, closures um, where you're restricting economic activity are difficult. Um, but you know we have, including the Clyde one, there's 11 identical. Um, the Clyde one's the one that gets talked about all the time, but but they're identical. Um, economically, a recovering cod stock, apart from the environment and, and flourishing fish stocks, isn't going to economically benefit a creel fisherman. I understand that. Um, but I go back to my original point, the best available evidence um, on terms of where cod spawn and how to protect cod is to stop disturbance. 
think creels are part of that disturbance factor. I'm not suggesting they are the biggest, but but they are on the cumulative level, and that's and that's why we do it. And it's difficult. It's difficult decisions or, or discussions to have. I, I, I totally accept that. And sorry, I think Kobe would like to come in on that as well. I just had a yeah, just to concur with that point about disturbance. But there, there is also the bycatch issue. So um, creel. You know, cod bycatch in creels is, is not insignificant in our experience. Um, we've, we've run projects recently where we require uh, live cod for uh, aquarium experiments um, for various different things, and we go, to, we go to creelers in order to get the live cod because we know they're going to be catching cod. They're not fishing for cod, they're fishing for crabs and lobsters and things like that, but um, they do catch cod, and, and we have fairly good information from um, certain, uh, certain skippers on, you know, that, that we go to for, this, for these, these cod on how much they're catching. So to the extent that we have just started up a two-year project, we intend it to be a two-year project, where we're looking at ways to design creels that mitigate cod bycatch. You know, we wouldn't do that if we didn't think it was an issue. So, um, this, this does not not only cod, haddock, and whiting, and other similar species as well. So, these do appear in creels, um, and we're working on ways to, um, to, you know, basically to help creelers devise methods by which they can continue fishing for what they're actually fishing for, and avoiding catching uh, fish that they're, they're not or they shouldn't be catching. So. Thanks very much for that. It's good to hear that um, that work's being done. I mean, from what I understand, the Strathclyde assessment provides very clear evidence confirming the results of peer-reviewed studies, i.e. that high fishing mortality, not seabed disturbance, is the key cause of low population size. And I come back to my point earlier, my earlier question, which is this bycatch from, bycatch from net, net Nepfrof's trawling that is part of the issue. And it's interesting we kind of end up getting back to bycatch from creeling, but I think we need to kind of keep at uh, the forefront of our minds that it's the trawling um, part that's the issue. Uh, and just on, on that also, um, I just want to come back to a point that Alan Gibb made earlier about the, uh, I think a colleague asked a question about the um, um, the, 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 the stocks, the kind of benchmarking of the west of Scotland. So um, I um, I just want to uh, bring forward this piece um, into the conversation. So uh, I'm quoting uh, from a letter from Gillian Martin. In, in the west of Scotland, the ICE's benchmark report 2022, it is uh, made clear that the best scientific evidence indicates that Clyde cod are very likely to be distinct stock from the rest of Division 6A, that's the west of Scotland cod, but they're lumped together with west of Scotland cod only because of data limitations. So that, that's a letter um, that uh, came uh, from Gillian Martin. So I just want to kind of get that out there and kind of uh, understand that a bit more, um, that, that the, these stocks are um, considered to be separate. And I think it comes also back to the issue that we've been kind of getting into a bit here today, also around data. And you know, we, we, I, I know that we um, uh, strongly um, carry out our work based on uh, scientific evidence, what we are, I think we're getting at now is, well, what is that scientific? Who's using which ones? I think uh, my colleague Eleanor Whittam had a very good point about you know, gathering evidence with the sector, but also with uh, you know, tremendous um, marine ENGOs that are doing work as well. And I think we really need to kind of understand much better the picture of what we're actually talking about, and it's interesting that Julian Martin in, in that letter did say that they are distinct, but they're lumped together because we've got data limitations. So there's something there we need to be doing uh, if we're not really able to get the best picture of what we're trying to uh, support in terms of stock recovery and, and other things. Again, to come back to the point, what we're trying to do, ensure that there's a flourishing fishery across all sectors. I, yeah, I think Alan wants to come in on that point. Yeah, I, I can. I think you can break that down into two points. I think, yes, I think um, most people believe that it's likely that's, so I won't say Clyde cod or Clyde stocks, it's likely that some of the cod in the Clyde are actually part of the Irish Sea genetic stock. But we don't have the definitive data to do that, so the international scientific community assess it as the broad western. But I, th I think that's irrelevant, actually. It doesn't matter if it's an I genetically linked to the Irish Sea or is genetically linked to the west of Scotland. It's equally important to give them an element of protection, because the Irish Sea stock is actually in a perilous condition compared to um, the northern stocks, um, to give them protection, whether it's an Irish Sea cod or a west of Scotland cod. 
affording that fish protection during spawning to allow the babies to be born and grow up is, is, the, is the objective. So Irish Sea or West of Scotland, I don't think, actually is relevant in terms of the objective. Um, the, the bit about the, what's the biggest part of mortality, um, yes, of course, um, fishing with nets, catching fish to sell for food is a big part. There are some um, a bycatch um, issues there as well. But it's the combination. Um, I said at the start, we sit here today having seen transformational change in the state of cod. There's a myth that cod is in a perilous condition in Scottish waters in the northern shelf. It's not. The biomass has almost doubled. It's been shown that there's no distinct west coast and north, and north sea cod stock in the mixing. I suspect that's similar with the Clyde and the, and the Irish Sea. Um, but extremely healthy, and it's hard to imagine that that level of recovery just happened on its own, that the measures we have in place, the mesh size, the juvenile real-time closures, the 11 seasonal closures, including the one in the Clyde, haven't in some way, it's improbable to think that they haven't contributed to a fantastic recovery situation for Northern Shelf Cod. question from Rhoda Grant. Just a supplementary on what's being discussed. I mean, we're being contacted by people who are usually urging us to take conservation measures who are really concerned about the science that is behind this closure. And you can understand, I mean, I think everyone wants to make sure that every stock of fish is healthy, but the trouble is that you're asking people to forego a quarter of their annual income on science that they don't really trust. And that, and that becomes very difficult. We're obviously facing a motion to annul this morning as well, which we have to make a decision on. And it seems to me that a vague, maybe in a couple of years' time, we will look at this. It's not going to be satisfactory to the people that are coming to us. So I guess what I'm asking is, is there a way of looking at this again to make sure that those less harmful methods of fishing can be allowed, those that can't move out of the area and have no alternative other than to shut up shop for, for, for three months. So I just wonder if there is a way of looking at this again, taking it back, coming back with a new instrument or a guarantee that next year we may get something quite different in front of us because we're, we're making the decisions about people's livelihoods without convincing science. You know, I absolutely appreciate the points that you make as well and um, that others have made around the table today. And again, these aren't decisions that we take lightly. We do use the best scientific evidence available, as I've already outlined today. But again, I think I would just want to highlight that if this instrument is annulled today, then that means there is no protection in place at all. So I, while I appreciate the points, I think that's where I would point to what I've said about the, the, the strands of work that we'll have underway to bring forward um, uh, and to consider in relation to the future and continuing to build that, that evidence base and that monitoring. Um, but again, if it's an all today, then it means that we wouldn't have any of those protections in place for spawning cod. They would come to an end. Can you give any assurance about looking at this again? and a, a, a faster time scale for... I, I mean, again, that's why the work that we've set out, I think, is a, a key step in relation to that. I mean, because, I, you know, as I said in a previous response to, to Jamie Halcrow Johnson, I mean, the position that we have and the order that we're bringing forward today may not be the same when the next time we bring it forward because there may be more uh, evidence or monitoring that, that changes within that time. So I can't prejudge what that's going to look like. But again, that's what I would just point to the work that we've, we've set out is going to be the key step in, in, in helping us develop that wider picture. I'm, d I'm just really pushing you here. Um, but I just wonder if evidence comes to the fore before you're due to renew this or change this, that you would bring forward a new order. Again, I'm not too sure what the process would be in relation to that. I'd have to take further advice, but again, 
we are basing this on the best uh, available scientific advice, and I understand that uh, you know there are views that aren't necessarily content with that. But I think that we have to base it on the best information that we have available at this point. I appreciate you pushing me because exactly of the points that you've raised that are really important, and of course this is people's livelihoods uh, that we're dealing with here. But again, I would point to the fact that you know I recognise that impact. This is a, a short-term closure, and we are trying to do it ultimately for for the protection of that stock. Okay. Emma Harper and then Rachel. It was on the supplementary so, so, yeah, no, it's a similar, actually. It's just to pick up on, on what has been said about, um, well, I suppose everything so far is that bycatch, the complete need for absence of disturbance on the seabed, and what Dr. Colby Needle said about changing the design of creels to avoid bycatch. It, it, it sounds like to me that it, you know we do need to be making sure that we're working with our fishermen. We've got the Galloway Static Gear Fishermen's Association. They've got 20 vessels, over 40 members, and I just want to be keen to make sure that that these people are experts in their, their knowledge of the territory and where they're fishing and everything. So just to make sure that uh, we continue to work with the fishermen to make sure that the science and the data and the evidence is accurate so that they can fish for the future. Yeah, I, I do think you know, that would raise a really important point, and I'd come back to the point that Kobe had made earlier as well about, I mean, how that engagement with fishers has already altered, you know, some of the plans that we'd had. Because you're absolutely right; they are the experts in the in the areas where they fish and, and know that really well, which is why we want to continue to work with them uh, in the in the work that we're taking forward. Um, but and I, I would also hark back to a point that Alan had made earlier as well. It's about all these measures in totality when we see the you know the recovery and how well it's. Doing at the moment, I think it's you know it's all these measures that we've implemented right across the piece to reduce bycatch, protecting the spawning areas that I think have all uh, really been critical to, to enabling that recovery. Okay. Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, it's a supplementary to Rhoda Grant's um, question, actually, because I, what I believe Rhoda Grant is trying to do is to meet the Scottish Government halfway Cabinet Secretary, um, and it is within your gift. Uh, the Scottish Government already demonstrated that they can make changes, and they did that previously. And if we take ourselves back to the previous uh, cod box closures, um, the consultation result um, in which the vast majority of responses were supportive of the previous situation, but a concluded consultation was reopened and altered with two campaign groups um, who complained on that. Um, so, therefore, we have had been in this situation before, and changes were made. Now, we've heard evidence today, which um, you know, we, we can debate shortly, and I won't go into that, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that, you know, if it is possible, there should be changes made, and there can be changes made, because the evidence that you've given today is not compelling whatsoever. I think in relation to that, and, I, and as I say, we're working, we've been using some of the, the same evidence base that we supplied previously, and I know there were similar questions at that time about the, the, the science that we're using, and as I've said many times today, we use the best scientific evidence that is available to us on which to, to base these decisions. But I think if we come back to, and I absolutely appreciate what you're saying and you know, the efforts that, that Rhoda Grant was trying to make, I think in relation to the instrument that's in front of us today, as I've pointed out, there's... If we annul that, there is no protection in place. We wouldn't be able to bring forward another order in time to, uh, to enable any changes, I, let alone, I think, allow the time for the measures that I've talked about for us to gather more information and evidence and monitoring through that. So again, I can't preempt what that work is going to look like or what evidence it may produce or bring forward. But again, in terms of what's in front of us today, if we annul that, there won't be any protections in place for spawning cod. And I think I really just want to emphasise that point. And I appreciate this. It's about you know, working together to try and find a solution and a way through it. Ultimately, that's where we want to be, which is why that work that I've set out today is so important, because I think it enables us to to do that. We will now move on to agenda item four, which is formal consideration of the motion to annul 
I'd like to ask Rachel Hamilton to speak to and move the motion S6M12276. Um, I move that motion in my name. Thank you. Do any members wish to debate the motion? Yes. Thank you um, for giving me the opportunity, uh, convener, and I think this evidence session has been very useful um, for all committee members today. I just feel like we um, are back in a mini HPMA nightmare here with confusion and resentment and the possible devastation of the livelihoods of local fishermen in the Clyde. Uh, we are repeating many of the arguments that we um, made last year. I was, I was reassured last year that the uh, government would actually come forward and learn lessons, but it seems as though today's position is unyielding, and I don't believe that there has been any uh, reflection on what happened last year. And I, I want to try to set out and summarise what some of my colleagues' um, arguments have been today in terms of their concerns. I think each and every one of us um, have concerns whatever party we represent um, and, and whatever action we want to see, whether it's one way or another to um, protect spawning cod. But I, I would ask, firstly, um, the Scottish Government why, as others have said, despite no additional monitoring of science in the area, that they have chosen to reinstate the Clyde Cod Box. I mean, that is the first question, and I don't believe that there has been a sufficient answer uh, around that. The uh, CFF also um, has said that there is no additional science or monitoring which has been conducted in this area, and there has only been a partial BRIA. There's not been a full uh, business and regulatory impact assessment, um, and that has not been conducted. And I would ask why, again, and, and learning lessons from last time. Um, in January, um, as has been said, the Scottish Government announced that measures to protect spawning cod in the Firth of Clyde will continue. Now, this is much to the disappointment of half of the respondents um, who support an exemption which my colleague Jamie Halko johnson um, was exploring in terms of where the government sits on those um, specific exemptions. We've heard today as well that and the Scottish Government have acknowledged and Alan Gibb has acknowledged that the stocks of cod have recovered in Scotland. Um, I'm not going to repeat uh, the, the, the areas that have been discussed, but why after last year's debacle had this not been the work um, that has been promised now in 24 not been carried out earlier. It just seems extraordinary. Um, convener, one of the main areas that we've heard today is the lack of reliable data. And the Cabinet Secretary said that they're using the best scientific evidence available. But that isn't good enough, is it, Cabinet Secretary, because the best scientific evidence is not available. There is insufficient data on cod stocks in the Clyde um, to, to acknowledge the um, effectiveness of the closures themselves. And I, as you'll be already aware, there's now a change in the West Coast um, total allowable catch with an increase in cod allocation and a change in the formal classification of cod, uh, Clyde cod to um, the North West stocks as opposed to the substock of the Irish D C, which only makes the clod, cl closure of the cod uh, stocks less justifiable in the eyes of the fishermen. And I also noted that uh, Dr. Kobe Needle um, had said that it was unclear and there is no evidence to treat Clyde Cod separately. So I'd like some clarification on that, if I may. Um, Mary Gujan herself admitted that Atlantic uh, Cod stocks were covering in just January. And further evidence gathering um, cannot also be carried out due to the cuts in marine, the marine budget, which we've heard. I mean, the latest budget, marine funding and marine budgets were worth a combined 99.9 .9 million in 23-24. This was cut to 93 million. So a lot of my colleagues have been asking, um, you know, how the resource and capacity of Marine Scotland uh, will play out in this. Our own 
Advisor Professor Paul Fernandes said that more scientific evaluation needs to be carried out, um, as again was mentioned by my colleagues. Uh, Professor Fer Fernandes also said that seasonal closures were not effective. That might be cherry picking that particular statement, but he said if they want to give COD the best chance to recover, the evidence suggests they are targeting uh, the wrong thing in terms of the closure. The 2005 um, ICES study is damning, and it found that the Clyde Cod box had no effect on Cod uh, stocks. Elaine White, um, Secretary of the CFA, said it was not convinced there was enough scientific data on the Cod stocks to justify the close closures, and she said that survey data was inadequate, data on Cod catches were being gathered from compliance boats. Boat, uh, officers boarding boats to check catches rather than scientifically. It was also collected from boats that were nowhere near the, clod, uh, the cod closure area convener. Now, moving on to the, uh, the financial impact, well, Jamie Halker Johnson covered that um, quite sufficiently, but over half of respondents to the partial BRIA um, supported some exemptions uh, to the ban. And we know that you know, it's important that the livelihoods of fishermen are supported. I'm really concerned that the Cabinet Secretary um, ha had made a comment that the, the 11 weeks is a long time. Um, but also, we were concerned as a committee that the cumulative pressures resulting um, in the uh, financial pressures would mean that fishermen are leaving the market. Now, that for me is anecdotal, but I am going to operate a tit for tat um, tactic here because all three of you mentioned anecdotal inf um, evidence. It, it wasn't clear evidence. Um, we're in a situation that. <laughs> We, we just cannot rely on what the government are saying. Um, the, 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 the partial BRIA that I was discussing earlier doesn't even reflect the financial impact felt by local fishermen. Um, and, and a lot of the fishermen don't feel that it was a viable option to suggest that they could simply fish somewhere else. Um, and as I said, the, even the increased time and resource of civil servants and um, the the organisations that represent fishermen spent on this issue um, has actually been disproportionate. Um, so we, we find ourselves in a repeat of, of this position where there's a lack of peer-reviewed uh, data to support the closure. Fishermen cannot fish anywhere um, and it's a, almost a, a nirvana of displacement. Um, and a ban has been in place for 20 years, and the government and Marine Scotland still cannot give us uh, proper information about why we should bring forward this order. So to conclude, um, convener, um, as described by the Cabinet Secretary, a pragmatic and evidence-based um, approach to, to protecting spawning cod, it's not. It's absolutely not. Um, she talked about the challenges of the socio-economic impact. It's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. Even if it's 11 weeks, it's devastating. Um, and so on that basis, I urge members to vote for the annulment in the absence of unclear advice from the government and an understanding, um, a lack of understanding that's been provided to this committee as to why the Scottish Government is taking um, this measure to close off livelihoods um, for fishermen in the Clyde. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does any member wish to do it? Ariane Burgess and then Rhoda Grant. Thanks, convener. As I said earlier, the science says that this SSI is necessary but not sufficient to protect and restore cod stocks. Rhoda Grant raised a serious point about the impact on creelers and divers' livelihood. Uh, 2015 document from Marine Scotland showed that trawling affects more than 18,000 times as much the seabed as creeling. So I would reiterate my request for assurances from the Scottish Government to, um, have this, um, to share the PhD work that the Marine Directorate and Professor Mike Heath at Strathclyde University are supervising with, uh, after you seek advice on that. Um, 
uh, with the committee so that we can see these recommendations for recovery. Um, I would also ask that um, there's a commitment to use the latest science, including that PhD, when um, the, there's a replacement for the Clyde closures SSI in 2026 and onwards. And I would also um, request that the Scottish Government begin scoping additional measures to protect the stock, especially by catch reduction, as the latest science uh, says that is the, the main pressure. And I'd also like to clarify a point about the Clyde cod stock being separate from the other West of Scotland, uh, uh, Scotland cod stock. It's not about genetics but about the potential to manage our Clyde cod stock separately. And the Clyde cod stock sits completely within the Scottish Government's purview. So we could absolutely bring in measures to minimise bycatch from trawling. And I'm glad to hear about the work being done on this, but I would urge for this to be accelerated given the state of Clyde cod as well as our at-risk seabirds. Thank you. Thank you. Rhoda Grant and then Jamie Heltra Johnson. And I accept that um, the Scottish Government want to take a precautionary principle, but I feel that they're not taking enough cognizance of the lack of damage that creelers and divers make. Um, so I will support the motion to annul on the understanding that I'm, I look to the Government to bring back another instrument um, as soon as possible to um, protect the spawning areas. There is bycatch in creels, but it it's not killed, it's simply let away. And so bycatch and creels is not a, an issue here at all. Um, and I would ask the government just to look at this again and come back with something sensible. Uh, thanks very much. I think the points that have been made by Rachel and Rhoda really cover most of what I was kind of intending to say. I think there's a lack of data and a lack of data that we can have a huge amount of confidence in, a lack of exemptions and, and generally a lack of trust um, in those organisations, those individuals who are going to be most impacted by that. Uh, I think there's too much reliance on, reliance on some of the anecdotal evidence which has been highlighted as well. And I think in terms of putting people's lives at hold, uh, on hold for even a short period and without the support and without the confidence in that information, I think that's um, not the right approach. Um, I'll be voting with the, for the annulment and uh, I would hope others might too. Thank you. If there are no other comments, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make her comments? I, thank you, Convener. I, I fully appreciate the strength of, of feeling that the, the instrument has uh, elicited, as I highlighted in my opening remarks. I think that I, I think just a few points of clarification I would like to make, because I think we have broadly set out the key arguments and set out why we're bringing forward the order today. Um, but I think in relation to, to Rhoda Grant's point about bycatch, bycatch isn't the, necessarily the issue here. We're talking about the maximum protection available for, for spawning cod, and it's that disturbance of the seabed which is predominantly the issue, given the number of creels and the disturbance that can cause. I just wanted to clarify that point there. Uh, also, in relation to some of Rachel Hamilton's uh, comments, um, in relation to the, the BRIA, a full BRIA was published. Uh, I don't know if you're just referring to the partial BRIA that was published with the consultation, but a full BRIA was published uh, with this instrument as well, so I, I would have thought the committee would have had that available to them. Uh, there also had been enhanced monitoring put in place since the period of the last closure as well, which I touched on in my comments earlier. Again, I've, I've set out our position today. I appreciate the impact that this has on fishers, but ultimately this is about the protection of the stock and ensuring we have that maximum protection for spawning cod. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Hamilton to wind up and indicate if you wish to press or withdraw the motion. Uh, I will press um, the, the motion. Thank you, convener. Um, I mean, the, in, in terms of the BRIA, the 61.7% supported the reintro reintroduction of some or all exemptions to the seasonal closure. Uh, I don't think that has been recognised um, or even uh, spoken about by... Um, the Scottish Government. I, I do understand that the Cabinet Se Secretary is sympathetic um, and wants to clearly um, support the, the, the spawning cod, but we're in a situation, as I described, where we this is, this is 20 years on. We've had plenty of opportunity to make changes. We've had plenty of opportunity uh, to learn lessons. The cod numbers have not 
recovered. We have to be absolutely clear about that. Um, and many of my colleagues have made comments around the need to examine alternative solutions to this issue rather than continuing with this failed policy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question is that motion S6M12276 in the name of Rachel Hamilton be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. no. We move to a vote. Um, Oh, sorry. We are not agreed. There will be a vote on the motion. Members should vote by raising their hand. And please keep your hand raised while the clerks record your vote. Sorry. Those members supporting the motion, please raise your hand now. Okay. Those members not supporting the amendment, please raise your hand now. Those members who wish to abstain, please raise your hand now. No. All members have now voted. The motion has not been, sorry, the, for, uh, the result of the vote is for, for, I can't say for, 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 for and five against, uh, no abstentions. The motion has not been agreed. And can I just clarify for the official report that uh, Kate Forbes voted online and voted against. The committee must now produce a report on this draft instrument. Finally, is the committee content to delegate authority to me to sign off the report on the instrument? Yes. That completes our consideration of the instrument. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary and your officials for attending. We will now suspend the meeting briefly to allow the Cabinet Secretary and officials to leave. Our fifth item of business this morning is consideration of a further negative SSI, the Sand, Heel, the Sand Deal Prohibition of Fishing Scotland Order 2024. Do members wish to make any recommendations relating to the instrument? Can I um, ask, and um, maybe we should um, write to the Scottish Government, just about what um, discussions they had with the Danish government and fisheries there. I understand we don't um, fish for sand eel at all, um, but I think it's quite important to the Danish fishery and it would be quite good to understand what discussions had been held with them and if indeed there's any implications of that going forward in negotiations on fisheries internationally. Yeah. Agreed. Um, our sixth... Our sixth item of business is consideration of two UK SI consent notifications, Retained EU Law Revocation and Reform Act 2023, Revocation Regulations 2024, and Plant Health Fees England and Official Controls Frequency of Checks Amendments Regulations 2024. 
Do members have any comments on either of the notifications? Are members content to agree with the Scottish Government's decision to consent to the provisions set out in the notifications being included in the UK rather than Scottish subordinate legislation? Yes. Sir. That concludes our business in public this morning and we will now move into private session. <laughs>